Hey everybody, welcome to Bioenergetic Basics with me, Danny Roddy. And today we're going to talk about five ideas that are associated with Ray Pete that he did not endorse or that he explicitly said were harmful. Before we get too far into it, The True Method of Knowledge is Experiment by William Blake and In Memory of Ray Pete, raypete.com. And this episode is brought to you by my course, Bioenergetic Basics, which is available on Patreon and Gumroad. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And this episode is also brought to you by Progest E by Ketogen and Ketogen at gmail.com. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so let's talk about the five ideas that we're going to run through. We're going to talk about the idea that Ray was very pro-supplement. We're going to talk about the idea of taking hormones away from the youth steroids, i.e. pregnenolone, progesterone, DHEA. We're going to talk about applying substances to the testicles or the belly button. We're going to talk about overeating to increase thyroid function. And then we're going to talk about the idea that you should aim for or strive to become PUFA depleted. And maybe that there's a little bit more nuance to that according to Ray and what he said about it. But before we get too far, I wanted to put a big disclaimer on this episode. The idea for this episode was not a dogmatic exercise to say, oh, Ray didn't say it, therefore you shouldn't do it. It was more to offer clarity in a space that's rapidly expanding. And I know a lot of people are not going to be motivated to go find what Ray specifically said about X, Y, and Z. And I know that people are probably accidentally misconstruing them on the internet. I'm just throwing this out there to add to the conversation, but I'm not trying to interfere with your relationship with experimenting with risky chemicals. And I'm just throwing this into the, the ether to see if it resonates with anybody. Okay. So let's talk about Ray Pete on supplements. If you go into any Ray Pete circle, you'll find people taking many, many, many supplements. And so was Ray a fan of this? Did he think it was risky? Let's find out. First quote, Ray says, the price of a supplement and the claims of its vendor don't have anything to do with its quality. So you might say that's so redundant. Of course, I know that. But I talk to so many people that are fooled by marketing. Some ways of making these supplements is extremely toxic. Like apparently some amino acids can be made from a fungus and then have the residue of a fungus. As we'll talk about in a second here, it's good to assume that all supplements are irritating or inflammatory until proven otherwise. So here's another quote from Ray. He says, it's good to be cautious with any supplement. There are lots of incompetence in the supplement business. If you want to make a lot of money in internet health, you will have a supplement line. The margins are huge. You will make tons of money. This is how empires are formed through supplement lines. And I think it's mostly a dirty business. Some people will learn the hard way that supplements are mostly junk and that there's a small percentage of things that are actually helpful. Straight from the source, 2018, Ray says, it isn't at all rare for people to have chronic disease caused by supplements, you know? (laughs) So if you want to get more into this, I would encourage you to listen to this generative energy number. 31. This is before the live stream. And this was done seven years ago. It's just Ray and I, and we go through supplements. He talks about how they're manufactured. And this quote from one of those episodes was really phenomenal. He says, when they talk about the chemical purity, that's only a reality in the mind of the chemist. It's maybe better than something from a crud or factory, but in relation to biological nutrients, it's just wildly out of the ballpark in terms of contamination. So any natural food is going to be extremely purified. Any supplement made chemically is going to be dirty just in principle. So again, having that that orientation that supplements are mostly harmful until proven otherwise. I think that's a good way to go. And I didn't put it in here, but Ray has another quote saying that some types of thyroid, progesty from ketogen, ciproheptadine, antibiotics in small doses like penicillin, VK, erythromycin, those are some of the safe supplements. If a person has a sensitive digestive tract, they have to be very careful with all this stuff. Okay, so let's talk about Ray Pete's view on the use of different hormones and the safety of using different hormones. So I have in front of us the steroid chart. It's very crude, but it shows how T3, LDL cluster, cholesterol and vitamin A are synthesized into pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA in the mitochondria of cells. And from testosterone, you can produce androsterone, and then that can be converted into DHT. Pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA are often referred to as the anti-stress use steroids. And Ray spent a lot of time writing about them and how generally protective they were to all systems in the body by stabilizing the cells. So let's talk about what Ray Pete thought about supplementing androsterone, testosterone, DHT, other hormones away from the use steroids. So this is from 2017. And he says, I think it's risky to supplement hormonally active intermediates in steroid metabolism since it can have widespread unexpected effects. He said, I think I might use DHT, but not androsterone or the keto steroids. I haven't used androsterone, but if it functions as a pheromone, as some people have said, I think that it could activate the pituitary in possibly harmful ways. The immediate feeling is so good that people usually overdose, risking long term imbalances in the metabolism. So Ray was not a fan of androsterone, but let's see what he thought about testosterone. So he says, The figures I've seen are around four to five milligrams per day. Stress and inflammation increase the risk that testosterone will turn into estrogen. So that was 2021. So the second one is from 2018. And this is actually my email to him asking if he could provide some references talking about the four to five milligrams that he had been talking about around that time. And he said, I think I saw the four milligram per day other places. When you put together the turnover of cholesterol, pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHA, something around four milligrams of testosterone fits into the picture. So I was assuming that 
he had calculated that. <laughs> and then we have one more from 2018. This is where he's talking about if a person wanted to supplement testosterone, what he was doing for himself. And he said, it's essential to have everything else in place, thyroid, calcium, magnesium, protein, vitamin D, vitamin E, pregnenolone, DHA, then one milligram per day can have very strong effects quickly. It is very well absorbed by the lips or the tongue. So one milligram compared to the hundreds of milligrams that people are taking, injecting into their bodies, high level of risk aversion from Ray here. Also, when a person is low thyroid, like Ray said in the first quote, they'll be primed to take that testosterone and convert it to estrogen. And I've talked to lots of people that felt manic when they would take testosterone. And I think the only way that's possible is if it's converting to a large amount of estrogen. So Ray was not a fan of androsterone, but he did think that you could use testosterone in very small amounts safely, as long as other things were in place. What did he think about DHT? The first thing I'm going to mention before I read this quote is that Georgie and I around this time were very gung-ho about DHT because we had both a chance to try it and I had a good experience on it. And I think Ray was the counter <laughs> to how positive we were about it. So he says, in general, things like that are not to be messed with unless you have a very specific knowledge of a deficiency. Because if you take a little too much, any of those defining feature creating hormones can change the whole system in an unpredictable way. And then he mentions taking things like vitamin D and DHEA and pregnenolone and, and thyroid and things to increase the DHT. Towards the end here, he says, in something like breast cancer or prostate cancer, it's one of the things that could give a big push to the system if you're wanting to interrupt the process. And that goes along with another email where he said he only really advocated something like that in cancer or some serious critical health condition. And I think this is in the same episode. Georgie asked Ray if DHT was the male equivalent of progesterone and Ray was not having it. He said, no, it was a hard no. <laughs> he said pregnenolone as the first thing. And then DHA, if you need more androgenic thing, the pregnenolone will push the neurosteroids, the crucial regulating things that don't want to throw out of balance with a strong androgen like DHT. That would be one big risk that you could throw off your neurosteroids. Okay. So let's move on to the next thing. This is topical application. So if a person's stomach is very irritated, very inflamed, sometimes it's safer to put things on your skin and the very toxic things, sometimes they're larger in size and they can't pass through the skin. So you'll get the vitamins, but you won't get the toxicity of whatever's in it. I think on a very old episode of Generative Energy, Georgie brought up the idea of using things on your belly button. And this never resonated with me too much because I had conversations with Ray about surface area being one of the most important things for topical absorption. And he was mentioning that you have to choose large part of your body and rub in very well the vitamin or hormone. And so in 2021, somebody did ask him and he said, I don't think there's anything special about the skin around the navel. And so again, I know there's a paper about this. So again, I'm not saying who's right. I'm just saying Ray obviously did not think the belly button was a special application place. And then this was a fad that I think grew out of the Ray Pete form of testicle application. He says in an interview in 2021, he said, I wouldn't do that because the vaginal membranes get it into the general circulation, but applying it very close to the testicle would be very likely to interfere with the metabolism, suppressing the metabolism, probably very powerfully lowering your testosterone. When if you put it on other skin, it lowers your stress reaction first and can increase your testosterone by lowering stress. And that was an interview with Patrick Timpone in 2021. And so if you're interested in the idea of topical application that sounds appealing to you, I talk about it in depth again on that Safe Supplements episode with Ray Pete that's still on YouTube. It's on my Substack, And we talk about it at 4709. And we specifically talk about absorbing 10% of what you put on your skin. But in other emails, Ray had said that it might be even less than that, five or 10% or so. So let's talk about the second to last thing, the idea that you should overeat to increase your metabolic rate and that this is a good strategy to maintain high thyroid function. I can understand why people get into this. For example, there was an author named Matt Stone a long time ago, circa 2008, that used to promote the idea of eating for heat. And people that are cold, they'll sometimes they'll eat a large volume of food and they'll feel very good. They'll feel very warm. But I don't think this is sustainable. And usually people end up gaining lots of weight and feeling terrible. And I've known lots of people that were completely oblivious that Ray did not advocate this method of increasing the rate of metabolism. So here's a quote from him that I could understand somebody possibly construing him saying something like this. He says, in one of the big nurses studies, someone noticed that those who ate the most lived the longest, i.e. had the highest metabolic rate. But I think the high metabolic rate people eat more. If you have high rate of metabolism from thyroid hormone, you might increase your caloric intake without gaining fat. Ray is so explicit that counting calories aligns very closely with the metabolic rate. And that if you go over that, you will start depositing fat. So he says in 2006, he says, the counting calories achieves approximately the same thing as measuring oxygen consumption and is something that will allow people to evaluate various thyroid tests. They may be given by their doctor. And he says in 2011, many studies have found that sucrose is less fattening than starch or glucose. That is, the more calories can be consumed without gaining weight. Something he did very often say is that you could eat too many calories, especially in the form of fat and gain weight. So he says you can get fat on butter in 2012. He says drinking a gallon of milk per day, usually 1%. Milk fat is usually good for a sedentary person. Full fat tends to be fattening unless a person is doing hard physical work. He said that in 2016. And I do talk 
talked to a lot of people that are coming off low carb, coming off carnivore. And in those spaces, they glorify fat. Like it's so amazing to get a hundred or 200 grams of fat every day. It's so nutritious. And I think not only are a lot of those claims false, but I think eating lots of fat essentially mimics the stress response. So I don't think it's a great idea. It's something that could be modified depending on the person's digestive prowess and their satiation from eating food. But I don't think there's any point to just eating a large volume of fat for no reason. Here's another quote from Ray talking about parathyroid hormone and how that poisons mitochondrial energy metabolism. So again, more focus on the metabolism and how the metabolism coincides with caloric intake. You can't divorce the two from each other. And then more recently, Ray talked about how certain amino acids could have a powerful suppressing effect on the metabolism, causing a person to gain weight. And so the interviewer asked Ray in 2022, he said, low fat, low protein, high carb for serious obesity. And Ray said, yes. So don't shoot the messenger. Okay. (laughs) So the last thing I wanted to talk about was the idea of eating four grams per day to deplete PUFA or the idea just in general that you should strive to become PUFA depleted. And so I just want to bring these up because I think they fly really under the radar. And so the question was, how many grams of PUFA per day do you think is safe? I have heard that you recommend keeping them under four grams per day, but I haven't heard or read anything from you about how much you personally get or recommend. And Ray says, I think I managed to keep mine below 1.5 grams most of the time. I've switched from regular coconut oil to fully hydrogenated. And then the person says, you have repeatedly mentioned PUFA accumulates with aging. My question is, if someone in their 20s started eating a diet with less than two grams of PUFA per day and maintain that low PUFA intake permanently into old age, would PUFA still accumulate with age? And Ray says, I think some would still accumulate in the fat tissues unless the total fat intake was low and PUFA intake was half a gram or less. So that's seriously (laughs) difficult to do. And so I'm just bringing this up because not to say that nobody should care about their PUFA intake, just that it's a problem like the bad environment. All of us have to deal with PUFA and it's not possible in the short term. Over the course of a person's life, they should probably strive to get a low PUFA content that as much as they could do without ruining their life. This just makes it sound extremely difficult to do anything like this. And half a gram, that's like a laboratory diet. And so he did mention one other thing in 2014 that was similar to this. He says, when you're under stress, by the time a person is about 30 years old, their tissues have had enough time to store the PUFA, even if they're not eating very much in the diet. So for clarity, I'm not saying don't strive to lower your PUFA intake over the course of a person's life. But if a person needs to keep two grams and it would still accumulate and they would need to take half a gram per day for it not to accumulate. In that situation, you might as well just figure out ways to mitigate the PUFA, mitigate inflammation, and because you will be accumulating it no matter what. So let's quickly talk about bioenergetic basics, which is a course I made on not theory, but more application. And so these are questions that I've gotten many, many, many times over the last 10 plus years of talking to thousands of men and women. I sat down, I filmed a two and a half hour course, and I edited it down to about an hour and 10 minutes. So if you enjoy these bioenergetic basics, I think you'll like the course. And so these are for people that want to get accelerated on how to use things in a safe way. Again, if you enjoy the content here, I think you're going to like it. This episode is also brought to you by Kenogen's Project. You can order it by sending an email to Catherine at Kenogen at gmail.com. And in 2018, Ray Pete said, I think it's the only good progesterone product. So how can you argue with that? (laughs) Okay, guys. Hey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You guys are the best. I have a really amazing audience for the show and I appreciate the support. I'll talk to you guys soon and peace out.